uh, I did a lot of thinking about numeracy um, and literacy and the project of the literacies of, of, of automation that, that I'm working on at the moment. And uh, um, I'm also not a numeracy person, but I would, I think that there are um, really interesting intersections between literacies and numeracies if we think about um, new environments where computational devices and in fact um, numerical binary <laughs> systems and algorithms are doing a lot of the thinking and intervening in the processes in which people are engaged in everyday literacy events. And so that is my angle into numeracy, um, but I don't speak specifically about the differences between numeracy and literacy, but rather come at this from an idea of kind of a new computational world that we um, engage in, one that is often hidden um, to us. And what are the implications of those hidden computational devices in our, um, uh, as they produce everyday life experiences and, and increasingly structure life pathways. So that will be um, kind of my angle. And Anka, I would welcome you to give me, I would like at least, I think you're hoping for a, maybe at least half the session will be a presentation and maybe the other half discussion. So when I'm about five, maybe 10 minutes out, of that halfway point, perhaps you could let me know and I can make a decision at that point about what to, I, I know I've overplanned, <laughs> overplanned and maybe underplanned at the same time. So um, once again, I'm really thrilled to be here and um, always have been very excited about and have been very excited about the collaborations with Anka and Klaus and the, and the group at, um, at University of Hamburg. Um, as Anka has said, um, I am an associate professor in adult literacy and adult education, and I do a lot of my work in community-based settings, and I'm very interested in everyday literacies. And I will be sharing a couple of stories of those everyday literacies today. Um, and I've entitled the presentation, The New Literacies of Automation, Justice in the Digital Era, Although I really realize that I'm coming to the idea of justice probably at the very end um, of the presentation, but it nevertheless underpins, um, I think, everything I'd like to say today. Um, the research project that I'm involved with and in all my research, um, as well as digital literacy and, and uh, community literacy practices are carried out in in part um, on the unceded, unsurrendered territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, the Squamish, and the Musqueam First Nations. Where I'm talking to you today in South Vancouver is actually on the unceded territories of the Musqueam First Nation. Um, and every day, in fact, we are living the experiences of what it means as settlers, and myself as a white settler, um, to live on unceded territories. And it's become very much the work of Canadian um, academics and scholars to situate um, the knowledge making practices in which we're engaged uh, within the context of being on unceded territories, territories that were never um, ceded, signed away or legally transferred by any treaty. That is not the case in all of Canada, for example. There are some treaties in Canada, but where I live in British Columbia, there were none. Um, and I think that increasingly we are becoming aware of what it means to, um, to do scholarship in that context uh, in terms of who benefits from the knowledge, creation, practices in which we're engaged, and what are the consequences of those practices for different groups, including Indigenous peoples. So with that note, um, I'll continue um, by sharing a little bit about the project for today and what I'm hoping to talk about. This presentation uh, contributes, I think, to an emerging conversation about the nature of literacy um, and numeracy <laughs> and adult literacy policy and pedagogy in an era of automation and artificial intelligence. So this, this study is part of a larger project. Um, the study I want to talk about today was is actually um, what Anka was talking about and referring to um, a paper that uh, Klaus and Anka and I wrote together, which I'll be talking about a in more detail in a minute. Um, and that project is now part of a bigger um, SHRC 
Social Science Humanity Research Council project called the New Literacies of Automation, investigating automation in local technology settings. Um, and what we're really, what, what's involved in that project and as well as in the project with Anka and Klaus is what, um, we're wondering what people's local experiences applying for entry level jobs can tell us about these new literacies of automation as they are emerging in human and machine assemblages. So in other words, these, um, these new interactions in which the human and the machine are participating together, but the role of the machine is often hidden or obscure. Um, as I share this study with you today, I also gesture and I hope to gesture to new lines of inquiry that open up in how adult literacy educators and researchers might take up um, the growing movement toward a more just and ethical experience in online environments um, and in the context of um, digital justice or justice in the digital era and uh, citizenship in the digital era. I want to start by telling you a story. Um, but first I need, um, I guess the, the, the story needs a few definitions of terms, which we're gonna be uh, referring to throughout the presentation. Um, one of the terms is e-recruitment. And this is, um, we talk about this a lot on our paper, referring to the use of web-based technologies to automate to varying degrees, the processes of attracting, reviewing and selecting job applicants. Um, automation also is, I think, a term that is used a lot, rarely defined. <laughs> um, and it is just um, very simply today defined as the creation and application of technologies to produce and deliver goods and services and to make decisions with minimal human intervention. Um, we can also see automation at play through um, through different computational devices with which we interact, some evident to us and some not, some hidden beneath the surface or subscreenic, uh, bots, automated um, artificial intelligence, algorithms, automated tracking systems such as crawlers, cookies, um, filtering, facial recognition, and so on. So e-recruitment involves both simple automation, for example, the conversion of Word documents to a PDF, autofill forms, um, but also the use of automated intelligences or AI, such as data-driven decision-making algorithms, sometimes also called machine learning algorithms that filter, sort, and rank people and their job applications. Um, so keeping that in mind, and I'm happy to go back to that if, if you need to later, um, I'll just share a research story. Um, as, uh, as Anka has alluded, I, I spend a lot of time in community-based literacy settings, watching people interact with computers and machines. Um, and I think the complexity of these interactions, especially in automated environments, are really hard to trace in conventional ethnographic methods. That's one of the challenges of this research. And I have found that it is by just telling the whole story of what happens that we might be able to um, at least see the complexities and then pull them apart a little bit. Um, so the story I'd like to tell you is a story of Lorelei. She comes up in the paper we wrote some of the story is, is told there and some of the story I'll also fill in today. Lorelei comes to um, a literacy project in the west side of the city, which we might call a traditionally affluent side of the city. Um, she um, was coming every week to use the computers, but never asked for help. Um, Lorelei has internet at home, but she does not have a computer with a lot of the different um, platforms that are needed to apply for jobs. Um, and so um, a lot of the, uh, the center was providing her with, for example, a printer, Adobe for PDF, and sometimes some help uploading and downloading. Lorelei had been working for about 10 years as a forklift operator in the tar sands, what we call the tar sands in Northern Alberta in Canada. 
she got that job after she had decided um, in her late 30s that she wanted to, um, she wanted a union job, she wanted better pay, she was tired of service work, and she had done a lot of work working in casinos. Um, it was exhausting late night work and she had a small child. She moved to Northern Alberta and she joined one of the many companies who, who works um, in the extractive industries. Um, I don't know if people have heard about the tar sands, I won't go into it now, but it's a very controversial um, uh, air industry. When Lorelai worked there, she was very successful in the sense of she learned very quickly how to use these machines. Um, she was hired by different companies through different contracts, um, which is at that in that context a sign of success. She would work for one company for a few months and then another as they kind of shared the work and she found herself well employed and um, and quite happy for a long time until when she hit her late 40s, her body just started to get very tired. Um, the work also became more difficult. Um, the working conditions in the tar sands became more precarious as companies began to pull out. Um, and then she began then to decide that she wanted to take her with her daughter, move back to the lower mainland in BC um, and try to um, find a, a decent paying customer service job. Lorelai then um, was very used to taking her resume as it was done in the tar sands and before she left for the tar sands to different employers and drop off her resume and make conversation with people and talk about her skills and they would say thank you we'll call you or we won't call you or you know come and sit down let's talk some more. So she's very much used to those face-to-face -face interactions and um, she she then when she came to back to the lower mainland she realized that everything had gone online she was being asked even from very low um, entry or entry level employers such as mcdonald's amazon walmart to put her uh, application online and that's where lorelei's problems and and difficulties really began because each time she did so she would wait for that call back. She would wait for that person to say, oh, oh I, I'll call you, um, thanks for your resume. And she just would never hear back. Um, and she began to become increasingly desperate. She, didn't, she had no idea that it would be so hard to apply for a job. She tried to go to these places in person to say, here I am, look at me. Um, I would really like to work for you. I'd be excellent, here are my skills. But again and again and again, the door closed, or as Lorelai said, there is no door anymore. There is nothing to knock on. There is only an, um, an uploading device or a window and you never hear back. What Lorelai also was finding was the skills that require that she, she said, you know, I'm very digitally literate. I'm, I can, I'm, I'm, I've got like a th two years of university. I see myself as a literate person. But each time I apply for a job, it takes at least two to three hours and I have to go online and offline and I have to write a cover letter and I have to do a personality test. And she was exhausted and just not getting anywhere and extremely frustrated. And the tutors at the, at the learning center just could find no way to help her because they too were being pushed online um, to, and everyone was resorting to the work of uploading resumes and waiting for a response. So I'll suspend the story here and um, just take a moment to unpack some of it because um, it's very easy, I think, to say, oh, well, Lorelai, you know, just needs to be patient or Lorelai needs to develop her resume writing skills. Um, but if we go back into the research, we can see that Lorelai and many others like her are part of a phenomenon um, that... Um, Geraldine Requeau, who's a French um, researcher, has called the um, at a distance employment um, or precarious at a distance employment assemblage. And so I'm just going to unpack that a little bit. The use of these e recruitment platforms, um, such as Lorelei experienced, do vary according to jurisdiction. We found, for example, that in Germany they are less used. But in Canada, the U UK and the US, um, online applications and job applications are now digital by default. 
this is where everyday, if you like, everyday AI and everyday computational devices meet the everyday literacies of job search. Um, Rick Hale, for example, found that the recruitment strategies that involve um, at a distance um, or at a distance recruitment are also becoming common, most common in the low wage sector. Uh, in, in places such as construction, retail, service sectors, particularly when these sectors are overtaken by large companies such as McDonald's, Amazon and Walmart um, that have the capacity to design and manage their own recruitment pro portals. However, even smaller and professional sector employers are increasingly turning to automation. And um, in fact, as um, Elizabeth has, um, her last name is Elizabeth, I don't know her first name, um, has also found um, they were reviewing resumes that are selected among the results of automated screening and personality tests. Um, so these big platforms such as Indeed.com, Monster and, other, and others pre-select candidates using automated tracking systems that are geared to finding the best matches between job descriptions and the applicants. Some employers also deploy algorithmic sorting of their top placements and then use the personality test to screen further. So we can see that as Lorelei, the human at the inside this assemblage, sees this as um, very confusing and wondering where the door is and how she can be seen. But what we also see is this complex assemblage of matching algorithms where people like Lorelei are increasingly at a disadvantage. Um, and just to unpack that a little bit, applying for jobs online now often requires sophisticated digital skills that can exceed those required for the job in question. In fact, the job application process is increasingly being used as a quasi literacy test for job eligibility with the rationale among some employers that if people can get through into the um, application process, then probably they're literate enough to do the job. But there's a mismatch between what's actually needed in jobs and the skills required to um, successfully apply for jobs. I think that's very important when we think about what we measure in, um, in digital literacy skills. Um, the effective experiences of interacting with online platforms also merit attention. Experiences of alienation, invisibility, and the hyper-individuality of, um, of these algorithmic uh, matching or matching algorithms, and I'll talk about that in a minute. These processes of exclusion cannot all be addressed by upskilling or giving people better or helping people to have better digital skills because inequalities in access to the hardware and software also exist. Um, in, a, in a sense, what we are doing, as uh, Stephen Reeder says, is we are privileging the virtual, the virtuous circle between access to um, computers and online environments and digital fluency. Those who suffer or those who are on the margins of digital access will not have those fluency skills. So sometimes what we can be doing is actually, um, and I'll make, I think this comes up a little, this will come up a little bit later as a point. In digital uh, literacy frameworks, we sometimes then as a proxy end up measuring digital access rather than digital skills. This was the case for um, Lorelei to a certain extent, but as she said, she felt quite, um, she quite, she was quite confident online. What was also happening for her was the algorithmically driven labor market information. Um, for example, there was a mismatch or in very narrowly interpreted employment cr criteria that employers would put in, but then the automatic tracking systems would reinforce and intensify. So for example, employers would say, we want a high school graduation. Well, some people, have high school graduation, but they don't put it on their resume because it was part, they might have graduated um, a little bit later as an adult at a college. They would be completely screened out of these applications. Any kind of, of expectation that the ATS has been trained to look for 
has to be part of the resume or it will be excluded. Um, and this is what we call this idea of this matching or mismatching in algorithms is how people experience um, being excluded from labor markets increasingly. And what happens too, and this actually should be, um, so should be referenced to uh, Kevin Leander and um, Rebecca Burris, that corporate actors are having an enormous influence on the texts we read and write, but that this influence is often hidden. So with all this in mind and with the stories, the problematics of Lorelei and other people's stories, um, we, we the, the research that um, Anka and, uh, and Klaus and I engage in together and that we are continuing here in Vancouver really seeks to problemize the discourses of skill, autonomy, choice and responsibility um, in the context of automated systems. We, we feel that we, um, we really need to think about literacies differently and how we um, present and measure them in these environments. We, um, we also, I think, need a more interdisciplinary theoretical set of resources to bear on automation and adult literacy. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then, so in doing that, we combined in our paper insights from ethnographic research, um, in my case, carried out with 15 adult job seekers, and an Anka and Klaus's Leo um, and their team Leo study, a focus on digital access and the relationship between access and fluency, where they took their LEO study data and began to drill down to what, what um, problematizing and asking different questions of their measurements. And, and um, I think this is absolutely vital. We do need long, uh, large scale measurements, but we maybe need to be asking different questions um, in terms of how we, um, how we develop those measures and how we interpret them. We also, I think, need in our field to propose new problems and questions to really come to terms with automation. So some of the guiding questions then, what is the role of automation in everyday literacy numeracy events? And in this case, with a job on, insert, uh, on job search, how do these automated agencies challenge definitions, policies, and pedagogies? What do these new literacies mean for adult education research and practice? How should we be doing our work differently? And how might adult educators and researchers uh, locate ourselves, I should say, within the growing movement for justice in the digital era? So I'm going to um, give you some more um, examples and, and some more th um, theoretical orientations and then return to these questions by way of a summary and conclusion of the presentation. The theoretical resources um, that I'm drawing on, and these are by no means um, exhaustive, are within labor studies. The labor studies movement is really looking at automation and precarious work. Critical data and digital studies. These are sociological studies looking at what we might call datafication um, and, um, and critical, um, critical work about the consequences of datafication, as well as digital literacies. With respect to labor studies, um, the rise in e-recruitment internationally, um, what these studies are suggesting is that this rise can be attributed to the co-emergence of automated technologies oriented to efficiency and convenience with a just-in-time globalized labor market that generates many hundreds or even thousands of employment applications for fewer jobs. So e-recruitment is touted as a means to bring value to organizations by providing them with wider access to a diverse and qualified group of job seekers, more agility in filling vacancies, cost effectiveness in the recruitment process and so on. Um, but from the perspective and from the perspective of job seekers, it's true that e-recruitment has a potential to per, potentially, potentially <laughs> democratize information um, about possible op employment opportunities. In other words, people get to see what's out there as opposed to what's in their local labor market. And it, they might also reduce discrimination because human biases include those, including those of race, gender, place of re residence and so on, are said to be removed from initial screening. In other words, the algorithm is just looking for the straight facts of your resume. 
but we'll see in a minute how that is not necessarily the case. In fact, a small but growing literature documents the negative consequences of e-recruitment, especially among entry level and low wage workers who live on the margins of digital economies. So for example, in India, Mangam, um, Mangam's research talks about the ways in which technologies and e-recruitment systems that are very well developed in India, yet the access to information for job seekers has paradoxically become more limited because the algorithm really decides if you're going online to indeed.com, it will decide what, what uh, jobs you can often see. Um, and in, in a sense, then reducing job opportunities for those who do not have access to electronic information and networks. So in fact, while paradoxically we say that people are getting more access to more information, it's also true that they're getting in, um, access to less and that those decisions are, are hidden um, and they're also increasingly uh, racialized and gendered. Um, and sorry, those decisions are being made by non-humans and humans. So by machines and humans, sometimes together and sometimes separately. Um, Geraldine Rico's um, uh, research similarly found that at a distance recruitment strategies, particularly those that are using automated tracking to match um, kind of best, the best resumes, can penalize re resumes that don't have the correct signals. And certainly this is what's what was happening for Lorelei in the story I told earlier. Those with non-traditional or non-conforming employment and education histories are placed at even more disadvantage as they are drawn into competition with the wider and often younger pool of applicants who have more streamlined employment and work histories. So once again, we have shifted away from looking at actual skills and capacities to do the job advertised to um, privileging um, uh, homogeneity and conformity in terms of um, life trajectories. And most, as most of us know who work with adult learners, they, they have spiky profiles um, and they don't have these, um, these homogenous profiles that now set them at a disadvantage. Um, so though the, those insights from labor studies, I think have been particularly important to my work, but also so is critical data and digital studies. So for example, um, Suks Oyedemi, a researcher at the University of Limpopo in South Africa, has done brilliant work looking at digital data as what he calls um, a new extractive resource after the era of colonialism in Africa where, well, I still, still today, cobalt, uh, diamonds, gold, and so on have been extracted from African countries. He now argues that the new data to be mined is digital data. And it is a commodified resource that is being siphoned from everyday activities online, powering both human and algorithmic decision-making. These human machinic collaborations um, these, this decision-making going on is structuring online experiences in at least two ways, directing, directing and filtering people to different information ecosystems and resources, including those of um, job opportunities, and also informing high stakes decision-making in a semblance of neutrality, efficiency, and evidence, such as the, um, the algorithm never lies. So for example, there's a lot, um, these uh, uh, people engaged in critical data studies are pointing out black box and automated decision-making um, that are occurring at the very junctures where citizens particularly racialized and LGBTQS plus citizens are most vulnerable, such as in entitlements to social services and resources, qualifications for refugee status, employment access, such as we are concerned with today and one's fate in criminal justice systems. Increasingly, all these systems uh, rely on algorithms, predictive algorithms, to make decisions about who is more likely to reoffend, who is most likely to succeed, say, in Canada as a refugee, um, who, is, um, who should be entitled to social services and so on. Finally, well, thirdly, the third group, a kind of 
group of literature or, or um, resources, theoretical resources to bring to this work are those of digital literacies. And I think that it's fair to say that these have tendencies along what I call the techno determinist and as well as critical views. Um, in terms of the techno determinist views of digital literacy, I think it's fair to say at least in Canada and, and some of the uh, international and global institutions such as OECD, um, and the European Union and so on, that most policies promoting digital literacy proceed on the assumption that basic digital literacy skills allow adults to take advantage of the digital economy. There is very little in these um, frameworks that um, account for or problematize the hidden workings of algorithmic intelligences, computational devices and so on. In other words, the digital world is considered as a new frontier of opportunity and digital literacy is the pathway towards that new frontier or to take advantage of that new frontier. Um, in this way then adult literacy education policies and programming are often preoccupied with establishing and interrupting causal connections between adult skills, employability and productivity. These causal relations, though, I think are deeply problematized um, when we insert algorithmic and non-human intelligences. So, for example, in the problem solving and technology rich environments, I'm sure we're all quite familiar with those. Um, I think it's an example of, of this techno determinism and this idea that the technology interfaces are neutral. So, um, the goals of the testing and the ways in which skills are measured, um, I think takes for granted um, the, the openness and um, readability, if you like, or um, of, of online texts, so that they are looking at abilities to use technologies and communication tools and networks to acquire and evaluate information, communicate with others and perform practical tasks. Um, as we know, most of those tasks were work, work oriented in terms of using email and spreadsheets and so on. Um, however, a critique of that that has already been brought forward by many is that um, these practical tasks center the discretion and autonomy of the individual. But in a sense, it's really, um, it's very hard to pin down and decide what work, what is a work related skill and what is a non-work related skill in today's um, information environments. Um, and also to what extent are algorithms and automation um, assisting and maybe also um, interrupting people's capacity to use spreadsheets and so on. A really great example is when I was working on this presentation, I was working on one computer that kept it had an AI working in the background trying to redesign my slides for me and making all these beautiful suggestions because it was reading the text. And the slides looked beautiful, but I found it kind of very, it wasn't that the images weren't what I wanted. So I turned off the automation, um, but too late because as you'll see, the, the slides that at the um, back end of my presentation are, are kind of boring. <laughs> um, but then again, are we going to say that it was my uh, my skills in developing the presentation, or is it me and the algorithm creating this presentation together? And I think that that's the question we always have to be asking now when we think about measuring skills. Um, so in a sense, a lot of digital competency, competency frameworks of which there is um, an explosion lately, um, is are we just chasing the wind? Are we trying to pin down skills that are always and rapidly changing? And are we also privileging what humans are doing and what we can observe humans doing um, rather than looking at what perhaps the algorithms are doing? So for example, if, I look at, if we look at the digital competence framework for citizens from the European Commission, this is a really, it's a very well researched, um, huge amount of work came out just last year, or actually it came out in 2017, and I think it's finding its way into different programs and so on. Um, but some of the assumptions are that we can measure these competences um, because they are observable 
and because individuals have control over the different tasks. So they have competence areas such as we are used to seeing, information and data literacy, communication and collaboration, digital content creation, safety and problem solving. And as we've also often seen, we have these very complex rubrics in which these are uh, laid out in terms of proficiency, where those who are considered at basic level are those who are needing help. And those who are considered at advanced levels are those who are independent and autonomous and might even help others. So we are still privileging this idea of the individual autonomous uh, person and looking at, at skills in terms of capacities to, for control and those who don't need anyone else's help. I think we need um, to problematize those views in the area of automation because in a sense, we are being helped all the time. These algorithms and these intelligences are working everywhere and always, and we need to learn to see them. And then we need to perhaps problematize the, um, why it is that we privilege autonomy, the individual autonomy rather than collaboration. And can we even come to a place where we can have more ethical and just collaboration between machines and humans? Um, and I, this is just a little kind of, it's very hard to see the other, but you know, one example of the job seeking process and how that is being taken up is that one of the skills or one of the self-assessments is that I can also find these job portals in my smartphone's app store. I know which portals to look for or to go to. And I think this is very interesting because it's gesturing towards the matching algorithms I spoke of earlier. From a list of generic keywords for job seeking available in the blog on job hunting, I can also identify the keywords that are useful for me. This is really interesting and important um, because the other, um, just to return to Lorelei's story, one of the things that one of the tutors um, began to teach Lorelei is how she could read the, read the job descriptions and strategically place keywords into her, into her uh, CV, whether it applied to her or not, whether it even applied to the job or not. Um, for example, it might be such words as um, effective communicator. So she would say, I'm an effective communicator because after what humans are now doing is reorienting, reorienting their literacy practices so that they are recognizable by the automated tracking systems in terms of matching algorithms. It's very interesting to me that this is alluded to in this um, job, in this um, criteria and in the job performance descriptions, but there is no mention of the fact that those keywords are going to be read not by humans likely, but by machines. And I think this is where we need to um, update and rethink some of these frameworks. Um, those who are engaged in critical digital literacies are bringing forward very, the, the arguments that I have been articulating right now. For example, Rebecca Anon has said about this, these digital, liter, digital skills frameworks and the European Commission's framework in, in particular, that they tend to measure inclusion and access. So this is my point from earlier. What we really are measuring is, in terms of skills is, if you're fluent in the digital environment, it's because you have privileged access to those environments. So we're, we are not measuring the needs of marginalized groups. And in fact, we often those frameworks will not work in the interests of marginalized groups because those indicators have been developed based on those who have ubiquitous access to technologies. Um, so there's a mismatch in the descriptors and those who actually need skills. Um, also, um, as Van Dyke has pointed out, um, and in terms of chasing the wind, the nature of online ecosystems are changing rapidly. We have no real way anymore of knowing what is and is not a technology rich environment. Everywhere is a technology rich environment. Walking down the street where we are captured by facial recognition cameras is a technology rich environment. Um, and Emma Julu and McGregor, along with Oyedemi, are also, um, I think, really important um, 
uh, authors in, in looking at the ethics and the colonialism in some of these digital literacy relationships. So this is a lot of text um, because I, I knew I'd forget Warren's story. Um, Warren is actually a tutor uh, in one of these, not the same as, as where we met Lorelei, a different program. But what Warren is getting at is what all these, um, so what these assemblages are looking like in terms of everyday practices um, and going back and just fleshing out these ideas of cognitive labor, um, the idea of how stressful and alienating this work can be. What Warren says is that people here tell me that they used to just go into a place and ask for a job and they would get a job. So kind of what Lorelai is saying, but that is no longer the case they can no longer get a job that way and you can't just walk into places. If you even manage to get through the doors, they will send you to a website. And this requires you to open an account and go through a lengthy process. Depending on the person's digital literacy skills, just this first step can take from 30 minutes to two hours. And each company has a different way they want you to create or submit a resume. If you have a res ready-made resume, sometimes you can upload it but other times you also have to fill in an online one and so on. So he's, he's finding very much what Lorelai found. Um, he also said that another third way is a third party website such as Indeed that will look for a job for you. And that's how people are seeing it as a kind of like the Indeed is almost like a partner in the job search process. <laughs> Um, they're going to look for a job for you. You fill in all the information, you choose a category, and then they look for a job that matches and they send you an email. And that is indeed how, um, that is indeed how <laughs> indeed.com and Monster market themselves. But um, as Warren goes on to say, the way it works is that a lot of people apply for jobs online and these, they're converted to a digital format. Employers and third parties such as indeed.com will do a keyword search and look for the matches. This means that people need to create resumes that contain words that match the key terms. It takes a lot of work um, for people to do that. They need to be able to analyze the job description carefully and so on. And the number of applications can be huge. There's no way a human can look through them. This is why they use machines to sort and decide for them. And I think for me, it's mostly the last point that is also important because what I, we're seeing is a different, a change in subjectivities where people are seeing, um, not only are they having to um, make, show how their work is, or their, uh, their whole life in terms of their uh, represented in their resume is recognizable to the machine, but they are also having sympathy in a sense with employers who need to use these. In other words, people are quite accepting of the use of these algorithms and they see the need for efficiency, um, but they don't necessarily see the ways in which they are problematic um, in terms of who is being privileged and who is being excluded. So just quickly then, um, if we return to the questions, how might we, we, we theorize the role of automation? Um, what Leander and Burris have said, and then what I've alluded to in some of the, the looking at the assumptions and the digital literacy frameworks and so on, is that we need to change our view of texts. Um, texts today, as Leander and Burris says, do not merely describe the world, they shape it and they respond to it. Computation has fundamentally extended the range of what a text can be from a dust, dusty set of textbooks to a Facebook feed or a chat with the customer service or even a therapist or a priest bot. In other words, robot. So how are we going to decide what are digital literacy skills that people are performing um, in terms of measurement and to what extent are those skills in collaboration with or intervening in or intervening with automation, automated intelligences. We also then need to change our assumption about the individual text relationship. And I've talked, I think a lot about this already, this idea of the individual as autonomous, um, as in control, as, um, as one, capa one capable of mastery. We tend to look at a linear and hierarchical view of skills towards um, novice to master. 
Um, however, maybe we need to be asking when are humans engaging as or with bots or the algorithm? To what extent is the algorithm supporting or intervening in mastery? What is mastery? Um, and also, as Leander and Burris elaborated, the various forms of AI appear to be doing work that has previously been understood as human work, reading, creating images, reproducing texts, art, and so on. Um, and they're also making identity assumptions and creating identities, and they're nudging at the right moment. So we have to, I think, start to think about the ways in which um, ethical um, relationships with text might be possible. So not only um, looking at the ways in which people are using online algorithms or they are using them, but also um, taking seriously these automated intelligences and how we can engage in more ethical relationships with them. Uh, Depal, who um, I think her name is Linda Depal, she's working in the UK, she's doing fabulous work, um, very much at the interface, watching as people do online applications and um, uh, does, had, did a very beautiful YouTube recorded lecture last year. And um, on what this is looking like um, in her, in the setting in the UK. And what she says is that we really need to pay close attention to the assemblages of AI thinking and interventions and where are those blurry lines are, um, what are those blurry lines that are shaping um, outcomes? So for example, I found a job. Um, uh, but as we know, those outcomes are becoming increasingly arbitrary and from actual skills and um, uh, well, delinked, or or I guess you say they, the relationship between skills and employment are becoming also very blurry in these interactions. Um, and as she also says that the architecture of job search discourses and pedagogies um, can become problematic if they hyper individualize job seekers. So why not? Um, do what liter actually why not embrace what literacy workers and tutors are already doing in programs, which is mentorship, which is um, providing people with insider knowledge. For example, people don't know about the matching algorithm that the, that they should use keywords, even random meaningless keywords in their resumes so that the tracker will pick it up. That's insider knowledge that's really important. Another hacking, and I think this has been talked about a lot, um, is that people will even throw in keywords into the resume and in white text because the tracker will pick it up, but the human eye won't. Um, I think those are some of the more um, visible examples, but there are other examples of how matching is happening that are more blurry and subtle and that as as researchers and educators, we need to find ways to pay attention to them. We also, as she said, we need to re reinvest in low, local labor market relations. In other words, literacy educators, researchers, those of, us, those of us who are designing measurements and so on, also need to look at very closely the ethics of labor markets, because what we are doing um, is and this is Richiel's um, observation and finding, is that we're placing all these entry-level job seekers into competition with a whole global network of job seekers. Um, and what we're doing and what we've seen in even in Vancouver is employers will say they can't find people for everyday local jobs. Um, and, and so it's actually creating jobs, job shortages or uh, labor market shortages in some markets because everyone's online being, being uh, filtered out <laughs> or in. Gangad Haran um, uh, has also done some fabulous work on this. I think she's at University City London now, but she was in the US. Um, she also says that critical digital literacies in programs should teach how automation is working in the background and also sometimes not so much in the background. Um, and also be able to create the conditions for resistance and refusal. There is a movement um, around digital justice that is oriented towards the refusal of automated technologies um, until um, the relations of production in terms of who is developing these algorithms 
and who's allowed to develop algorithms and so on. Um, and in terms of the corporate concentration of ownership of those intelligences and the views of Facebook, um, Amazon, uh, we can go on and on with the, the corporate. And most of those people are white middle-class males mm -hmm. who have been driving these discourses. So a lot of people from critical race um, discourses like Gangadhara and critical literacy are saying that what we actually need is refusal, not only adaptation. Um, and I think um, this, this is the point, and it's probably not a new point, but to emphasize, and it's a reader's point too, that came out of the, the, the work that Anka and Klaus and I did together, that um, we also have to be very careful that the longer people are unemployed or away from workplaces, the harder they find it to use the digital um, platforms. And so we probably need different pedagogies for people differently placed in the labor market. And rather than treating all learners who come in the door as a one size fits all, um, we need to pay attention to cognitive and effective labor. Berardi, uh, Marxist, um, a Marxist theorist of alienation, um, has done a lot of work on just the ways in which Lorelei expressed to me how tired she was, how invisible she felt, how she just, as she said, the agency has been taken away from me. I think we can't just ignore that alienation. We have to begin to take it up as a pedagogical issue. We need to challenge at all times technological determinism. These are not innocent platforms or devices. Um, and there's some really fabulous work um, from a, a black critical, um, critical race theorist um, looking at speculative and critical futurities in terms of the ways in which race and gender relations might be reimagined with technologies, um, the, the cyborg discourses, um, but ethical assemblages. We need to pay attention to digital colonialism as a new form of colonialism affecting African countries, Latin America and so on in terms of who has access to what kinds of internet, um, internet infrastructure. Uh, I can say more about that later. We need to pay attention and be part of the conversations about citizen, right, citizen rights in the digital era. Um, there's a lot of work being done. Eisen and Rupert, I think there's a double P um, that we should be um, there. Um, and um, uh, Noble, um, Umafa Noble, who's looking at the racialization of algorithms. Because if decisions are being made at the places in which citizens, if, if automated and inscrutable, invisible decisions are being made at places where citizens are most vulnerable, then those black boxes do need to be open because life pathways and trajectories, well being, and even life and livelihood are deeply affected by the work of these algorithms. We, we, we cannot, um, we can no longer see them as innocent. 